Welcome everyone in person and on Zoom. We're happy to have you here. As John baptized new converts, he invited them to live with changed hearts and lives. When asked how to do that, his answers all point to making sure no one is cheated or left without the basic necessities of life, including the right not to be harassed. A full life of joy, which the prophet Isaiah describes as an ever-flowing spring, is the birthright of all children of God. May we act to make it so. a wave of hello, peace, faith, and fellowship to the people around you and to the people worshiping at home. Peace be with you. this week.
this is the most kids we've had on one Sunday since I've been here. It's good to see you. I do have a question for you today. Are there presents under your tree at your house? Hmm? Lydia, you, there's no presents under your tree? Not yet, huh? Well, some of you who have presents, I have a question for you. Have you looked at the tags to see if any of them are yours? You don't think any of them are yours? Savannah, did you look at the tags? Don't know of any of yours? Well, I want to tell you a story today about a, a young boy who checked all of the presents under his Christmas tree every day. He was looking through them, arranging them, and counting them. One day, he discovered that his sister had more presents than he did. He ran to his mom very upset. Katie has more presents under the tree than I do, he cried. Well, his mom explained that getting gifts under the tree isn't what Christmas was really all about at all. Because at Christmas, Jesus is our best gift. Have you ever felt the way this boy felt? That someone got more of something than you did? We've all felt that. Yes, we have. How did that affect your joy or your mood? Did it, did it take away some of your joy? You weren't quite so excited? Put you in a bad mood, maybe? Well, Christmas shouldn't be about that. Christmas is a time of joy. Today, we're going to learn that our true joy comes through Jesus' birth, not through the presents that we receive. In fact, God tells us that it's better to give than to receive. In the Bible, John the Baptist was sent to prepare people for the coming of Jesus. He told them to repent of their sins and prepare their hearts for the Savior. So what should we do? The people asked John the Baptist, and he replied this. If you have two coats Give one of them to someone who doesn't have any. If you have food, share it with those who have none. The message is for us, too, today. If we want to experience real joy, the joy that Jesus wants for us, then we must learn to share. By sharing what God has so generously given to us, we will receive even bigger and better gifts, the gift of joy. Would you pray with me? Dear God, help us to learn that it is through remembering Jesus' birth and giving to others that we receive true joy at Christmas. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. We're going to go to worship and wonder. So remember to walk more slowly, walk very quietly, and your greeter will take you. Good morning, church. As we come into our time of prayer this morning, I do have just a couple of updates to share with you. So as we begin our time of prayer, I'm going to ask you to get a little bit comfortable. We'll do a couple of our breath prayers after Steve sings for us, or we can sing with him, actually. We know it by now. Make of my heart a stable. Let's enter into our time of prayer.
left undone that created less joy in a hurting world. Let us breathe in this regret and breathe out to the life-giving, forgiving Spirit of God. Breathe in and breathe out again with the joy of Christ. the doors of our lives to the call of the Spirit, inviting us to become more than we can ask or imagine. Let us breathe out our fear and breathe in the courage of the Spirit of God and out again with the peace of Christ. God, in this moment, we open the doors of this church, filling it with the compassion of Christ for all those who are struggling. God, it's the most wonderful time of the year. The music swirls around our ears from countless speakers in, stere in stores, on the radio and on TV. But God, we aren't so sure about that. We have been so wrapped up in preparation for the wonderful season, we can't seem to find the joy. So many people are in need. We have friends and family members who are suffering from illnesses, loss, alienation. God, we want them to be happy, but we can't make that happen. We bring the names to you, God, for your healing mercy and rest in the assurance of your loving presence with them. That is a comfort to us, but we also stand in need of your healing restoration. God, we are feeling depleted, discouraged, and exhausted. Slow us down, Lord. Help us to feel the joy of your love from the inside out and in every direction. Remind us that your gifts of love is freely given to us so that we may be healed and be a blessing to someone else. Touch our hearts and our spirits so that your joy may spring from our lips and from our lives. For we pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Of Isaiah, help us hear his word. God is indeed my salvation. I will trust and won't be afraid. The Lord is my strength and my shield. He has become my salvation. You will draw water with joy from the springs of salvation, and you will say on that day, thank the Lord, call on God's name. Proclaim God's deeds among the peoples. Declare that God's name is exalted. Sing to the Lord who has done glorious things. Proclaim this throughout all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, city of Zion. 
because the Holy One of Israel is great among you. Our second reading today comes from the book of Luke. Then John said to the crowds who came to be baptized by him, You, children of snakes, who warned you to escape from the angry judgment that is coming soon? Produce fruit that shows you have changed your hearts and lives. And don't even think about saying to yourselves, Abraham is our father. I tell you that God is able to raise up Abraham's children from these stones. The axe is already at the root of these trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be chopped down and tossed into the fire. The crowds asked him, what then should we do? He answered, whoever has two shirts must share with one who has none. And whoever has food must do the same. Even the tax collectors came to be baptized. They said to him, teacher, what should we do? He replied, collect no more than you are authorized to collect. Soldiers asked, what about us? What should we do? He answered, don't cheat or harass anyone and be satisfied with your pay. The people were filled with expectation and everyone wondered whether John might be the Christ. John replied to them all, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than me is coming. I'm not worthy to loosen the strap on his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The shovel he uses to sift the wheat from the husks is in his hands. He will clean out his threshing area and bring the wheat into his barn. But he will burn the husks with a fire that can't be put out. With many other words, John appealed to them, proclaiming good news to the people. May God bless our hearing and understanding. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Advent 3 takes us into this question about how much is enough? It is the idea that we live oftentimes in this sense of scarcity when truly all we need for joy is present, powerfully present. So the Isaiah text for today is already assuming the abundance, the drawing water with joy from the street springs of salvation. And a spring is something that actually, well, it's bottomless. A spring is always there. It's ever flowing. Anytime I see this mention of a spring in sacred text, it feels like it's pointing to abundance, a never-ending supply. Whether we think of them as springs or waterfalls or even oceans, they're kind of hard to drink from. You have to bring a cup or a water bottle or even a jug to take water that you need. You take some, a reasonable amount for you or your family, and as soon as you do, there's as much left there as before you began. It reminds me of the Old Testament stories of manna how you get enough for today, and yet tomorrow, there's still enough for tomorrow. It's learning that rhythm of trust and hope and experiencing that in a way that is only taking what we need and nothing more. And knowing also that after what we need, we take, that the rest belongs to everyone else, and not just everyone else, but to creation itself, for that matter. And that is what Isaiah is saying, that it is God who has done all of these glorious things for the earth to provide these ever-flowing springs. 
This is even bigger, I would say, than the biggest spring we could imagine, say one of the oceans, because God's spring goes out to every nation on our planet and never runs dry. To have joy by ourselves really isn't possible then. In this way, if we're not sharing what we have, then it's not true joy. A quiet moment of contentment, for example, can be a very good thing. But if it's true contentment, it moves us more than that and draws us outward from being content to reaching a bigger community. And this experience that the Holy One is great among us is something that can and will heal our entire world. Not just our city, our church, or even our community, our kind of people, or even our way of life. The joy just moves out so much farther than anything we can imagine if we only allow it to do so. The idea of growth and creating a just society, the fruits of changed hearts and changed lives, has to do with how we are creating well-being within the community, like following a pandemic or in a major time of church transition. It has to do with trusting and not being afraid. So afraid that I need to just look out for me and be concerned with the equity or that I won't have enough. <clears throat> no, my friends, that's not what Isaiah is saying. There's more. There's much, much more. For there's a trust in God, the trust that leads to hope and peace and justice, and yes, to true joy. I love the simplicity of what John is talking about in our gospel passage, as well as about a change of hearts and lives, because people ask him, what do you mean? Let's think today about a physical heart transplant. It is a really big deal. To say it's complicated would be a gross understatement. So now, imagine a heart or soul transplant. Believe it or not, a soul or heart transplant of this kind is just as complicated in ways it may be even more so because you feel you just can't. You just can't change your heart. Real change would be too disruptive in my life. And what John keeps showing us is no matter who we are or what we do, every day there's an opportunity to reach out to reach out even to just one person. And that's, that's what it means to have a heart change or a heart transplant, a changed life. He says, if you have two of something, share one with someone who has less. Take the food you have and share it with another person. You see, we don't need a large task force or an initiative with massive global funding to cure hunger. That's not what we're called to do in this passage. We're called to feed people one person at a time. Our theme, housing the holy, is reminding churches, reminding us that sometimes the problems feel so large that we feel incompetent to the task. We freeze, or we're not sure what to do. But there's one thing to remember. 
We can't fix it all. But we can do what's right in front of us, which actually invites us to simply open our eyes and extend outward. In some ways, it means to open our doors, to come out of the church, see what's happening right there. What one thing could we do as a church? What one thing could we do to decide what really matters? The best way to do this is open our eyes and take care of the first thing we see. Open the door of our church and take care of the first people we see. And that changes lives. It's one of the beauties of the Advent season. Everything good starts out so small, it's almost invisible, like a small, tiny baby. Every good deed starts with something that has a potential that you don't even recognize. And yet, again, nourishing those righteous branches is what gets them to grow into a shelter. A shelter to house the holy. And when we do, we can all say together, Amen. Each week in the Christian church, Disciples of Christ, we give you an opportunity to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. If you've never done that before, we invite you to do so today as we sing together a hymn. I'll meet you here on front or reach out to you through Zoom, and I'll share with you a profession of faith that we find in Scripture, and we'll look forward to your baptism in the near future. Maybe today you have made that decision or one similar to it, but today during this Advent season, you'd like to reaffirm or rededicate your life. We do that the same way. Or maybe today is the day you'd like to make Compass Christian Church your church home. As we sing together of the Father's love begotten, I invite you to make these decisions. baptized new converts, he invited them to live with changed hearts and lives. When asked how to do that, he, his answers all point to making sure no one is cheated or left without the basic necessities of life, including the right to not be harassed. A full life of joy, which the prophet Isaiah describes as an ever-flowing spring, is the birthright of all children of God. Here at this table, we claim 
that birthright. Here, no one is cheated or left out. All are welcome. Come and find the joy of this meal. Scripture tells us that on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after the meal, he took a cup And when he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and said, This is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you. Drink this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim Christ's death and resurrection until he comes again. Let us pray. Holy God, source of all goodness, we give you thanks and praise for your dwelling among us in Christ Jesus. We marvel at the one who opened wide his arms for us on the cross and put an end to death by dying for us, creating a new and holy people. As we eat and drink these holy gifts of bread and juice, May they be to us a living memorial of Christ's sacrifice. By your Holy Spirit, make Christ known to us, that we may join the mighty host of all believers in growing into his likeness, looking to the day when we shall all be one in the fullness of your reign. Amen. And now lifting the cellophane from our bread. Let us partake together. And likewise, lifting the juice, the foil from the juice. Let us partake. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Many imaginative, imaginative tales have been spun about the inn and the people who may have been involved in the story. As we've already said, we know very little about the circumstances from the Bible. Another theory is that it wasn't an inn at all, but the downstairs of a house where the family animals were kept under the top floor where the family lived. This scenario suggests that each and every home may be a birthing place for more goodness in this world. It suggests that this house of God, this church, might contain a surprising nook or cranny that could house a holy endeavor for bringing more joy to someone's life. Let me share with you one such story out of Nashville, Tennessee. To Michael Latcher, president of Anchor Investments in Nashville, a Tennessee-based real estate investment company, getting the details right is always top of mind. Those details are focused on ensuring that others feel valued, supported, and welcomed. And that means everyone, whether a guest at one of the boutique hotels his company has developed, or a person experiencing homelessness. Anchor Investments, under its Mission Hotels division, donates more than 50% of profits from its three Nashville hotels to organizations making a tangible impact on the city. To date, that has translated into more than 100,000 showers, meals, and beds, through ministry partners such as Nashville Rescue Mission, Room in the Inn, Shower Up, and People Loving Nashville. 
Two of the company's three hotels are in renovated church buildings. As these unique properties have continued to gain attention, the hospitality side of the business has continued to grow. Latcher decided to go all in with the hotels as an economic engine for ministry, expanding it as much as the Lord will allow. What an amazing way to think outside of the box and to house the holy. Let us now collect our morning tithes and offerings. Transforming God, take these expressions of our labor and turn them into hope for the weary, liberation for the oppressed, power for those who are dispossessed. Take us flawed creatures and manifest in us your love that knows no end, your faith that can do all things, your service that spares no cost your patient endurance that hopes to the last. Amen. Amen. It has been good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. We have a couple of announcements to share. And before we do that, I do apologize that we left a very important group of folks off of our prayers today. I'm sure they are all on your heart. And that is the folks affected by the tornadoes. First Christian Church of Mayfield was one of the four downtown churches that was completely destroyed. So Week of Compassion that we give to um, is already on the ground there, serving not only those people of First Christian, but all of the people that have been displaced by that tornado in that town. If you would like to give a little more to help in that effort, right, Week of Compassion Tornado Relief on an envelope, and we will make sure that it gets to Week of Compassion. Or easier yet, go to weekofcompassion.org, and you can give directly online, even designating it for tornado relief. I do apologize for not mentioning that during our prayer time. So today is the day. We are going to clear this space, and we are going to set up six stations for telling stories and we are going to prepare the place for our live nativity this weekend, Friday night from 6 to 8. Since we're going to be all set up, you just have to arrive a little bit beforehand. What, 5.30-ish, Dave, Debbie, 5.30-ish? Probably plenty of time. Um, and then our guides will be ready to meet people because everything is going to be up. If you brought nativity scenes today, we're going to start setting those up tomorrow. You can just leave them in the conference room, hopefully with a name of some kind on them. That would help us greatly as well. And then next Saturday morning, we're not even going to tear down after this nativity. This is great. We're just going to do our six to eight hours and worry about cleanup on Saturday. Gathering around 10-ish. If you want to come a little early, that's fine, or stay a little later, that's fine. But we'll get it all cleaned up. Remember always, many hands make light work. My concert this afternoon is at St. Catherine of Siena in Westwood. 
If you get off of Montana Avenue, off of I-74, go up the hill, there's some side streets, a neighborhood up there with signs to St. Catherine of Siena at 3 o'clock. Tuesday night is our mission leadership and board meetings. If you are a mission leader of any kind, please join us for that meeting. And then we go into our board meeting. Remember that everyone is invited to those meetings and that board meeting. You can only vote if you're an official board member, but you're welcome to log in and see the, or contact the office if you need that login. And we have set a time with the elders uh, meeting this past week. We, the elders, came to a consensus that we will do 7 o'clock this year for our Christmas Eve service. 5 o'clock on a Friday seemed not the best time um, with folks still having to work, and that seems to be right in the middle of dinner. So we made it not too late, so kids still be involved. We will be uh, using our theme, the inn, housing the holy we will have candle lighting and the whole nine yards and silent night, of course. So join us for our Christmas Eve service at seven. In addition to our week of compassion, if you'd like to give to that, this week and next week is our Christmas offering. One thing to note about our Christmas offering every year through the general church is that 100% of it stays right here in Ohio. This is the only offering that does that. All of the other offerings like reconciliation and Thanksgiving and all that, they we share the money. But this 100% of your dollars will stay right here in Ohio. And as I shared with you, our budget looks really good for 2022 in the region of Ohio, but that is dependent upon a good Christmas offering. So I encourage you to pray for how much you can give to our Christmas offering. Our closing carol to uh, any other announcements. I hope a lot of people can stay after. I cannot, unfortunately. I have to be on the other side of Cincinnati by 1:30, so I need to run. So our closing carol today is "What Child Is This?" It invites peasants and kings to claim Christ as their own. Chatterton Dix, the the author was not a clergy person like most of the hymn writers of the 19th century. He was a businessman in England. He asked the question, why lies he in such mean a state, referring to the stable? And in the original second verse he wrote, he answers by connecting the humble wooden birth manger to the wood of the cross made for his death. Why lies he in such mean a state where ox and ass are feeding? Good Christian fear for sinners here, the silent word is pleading. Nails, spear, shall pierce him through. The cross be born for me, for you. Hail, hail the word made flesh, the babe the son of Mary. True joy acknowledges the suffering of the world and invites all people regardless of status to claim Christ's grace and joy as a salve for the soul. May we offer warm laps and soft lullabies today to soothe a hurting world. Let's stand together and sing this beautiful carol.
May God's door of welcome swing open in your heart and in your life. May Christ's humble first dwelling remind you of the plenty you already know. And may the Spirit lead you into more possibility and hospitality than you can imagine, making room in the inn for all. May it be so for you. May it be so for us. May it be so for this church. Amen.